We do all kinds of things here at Word in Your Ear. We do podcasts. We do video casts. Quizzes. Crowdcasts with famous authors. And we can guarantee to make your next birthday one you will never forget. There's only one way to make sure you get all of this. You get it in full and you get it first. And that's by becoming a supporter on Patreon. Details here. I think it's probably a year ago, pretty much this week since this book came out in hardback and uh, and ever since then everybody's been at home and had plenty of time to read it and uh, there's plenty of time for it to come out in paperback so we finally catch up with the author of it craig brown craig nice to see you Morning. great to see you uh we we catch up with you in time for the paperback uh, for the paperback launch of this um nice to see you you must be very gratified by the the reception it had is had over the last year Yes, because actually while I was writing it, I thought, you know, all those people who know uh, more about the Beatles than I do, um, and they'll be, you know, absolutely hating every second of it. But actually, I mean, there have been one or two, but um, and I've made one or two mistakes. Uh, but um, no, by and large, people have got the point of it, I think. But it's, it's managed that incredible trick of appealing to people who know a lot about the Beatles, like Dave and I, who knew quite a few of those stories, but the ones there were some we didn't know, and the others that we did know, which was so beautifully told. And it appeals to people who really know very little about the Beatles at all. It's just really a series of absolutely electrifying anecdotes, isn't it? Is that the way you structured it? Uh, yes. Well, I mean, I realised I had to tell the basic story. I mean, the basic story is also just a really good story. Um, yeah. You know, and the family stories like with Aunt Mimi of people and uh, and the sort of hangers on. But then I just do like um, the 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 very peculiar uh, <laughs> bits. And so I mean, like I've got a whole chapter on Anthony Burgess's hatred of the Beatles or that kind of thing. Which yeah, is rather, which if you were writing a normal Beatles book, you'd think, well, I can't. You know, might be yeah. a little footnote. But I made a lot of the things which would normally be footnotes. I turned into chapters. Right, right. And I also did, I mean, if you wanted a comprehensive history of the Beatles, it, you know, you should probably go to other books because things like, things I didn't have really anything to say uh, or to add to, I think Linda McCartney, I only mentioned once. I mean, not for any liking or disliking of it, but I just, I didn't have anything to say about her. Or, and I, I kept thinking, well, I must write about Magical Mystery Tour. But again, I couldn't. And there is lots to say, I suppose, but I couldn't think what what to do with it. I mean, I'm not a great lover of the magical mystery talk, but it's obviously sort of, I don't know. I, anyway, I didn't put it in. So there are lot, lots of gaps, but in a way that the, the way I structure the book, it allows for these gaps. I yeah. Like, but before we get on to the, 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 the shape of it, I think it might be worth talking about your kind of personal relationship with the Beatles, because you mentioned in the book that you were, I think, seven in 1964 when you get a Beatles wig for Christmas yeah, yeah. and because you were born I think in 1957 and then there's this extraordinary chapter about the White Album coming out just tell us about that you were at boarding school weren't you and obviously albums were a kind of messages from the outside world and very yeah, treasured I, and very I, mean, great I, I, lived, um, I lived near Dorking I say I lived you know I was only seven so it was just my yeah. family near Dorking and so there was a, a a good record shop in Dorking and you could I mean I I, so I ordered uh, the White Album. Uh, uh, I certainly ordered Abbey Road, and I, I must have ordered the White Album. Anyway, we had a copy yeah. in my boarding school of the White Album. And uh, my friend Charlie Miller and I um, uh, used to just uh, listen to it obsessively, I think. Um, and it had all the lyrics. And then we, uh, we were very spooked out by... Um, Revolution number nine. <laughs> I think I still am. You know, I listened to it a few times. I've got a chapter on that, I think, in the book. Um, and uh, but we would sit. There was actually a, a, a an odd kind of club in the in this prep school. It's only you know took boys up to the age of twelve. Um, called called the Cavern, which I now realise must have been based around the Cavern. Yeah, didn't <laughs> think of that until about you know six months ago, probably after writing the book. Um, and so we'd put the lights out and try and listen to Revolution Number no. Nine with the lights out, really spooking ourselves out. It's like being on a ghost. That's show. such a brilliant approach to it because you know you, you always read about Beatles music uh, as, uh, in the terms of kind of adult rock critic perspective. But the idea of an eleven-year-old, the key thing was, can you sit in the room in the dark and yeah. put up with the entire eight minutes of this? Which you couldn't, could you? It's just too sinister. Number Nine. I mean, it's very spooky. 
And then all the you know, kids, uh, voices and Yoko in the background and the sort of caterwauling. And um, it, it is a very creepy. I still find it uh, creepy. And that might just be some going, you know, post-traumatic stress. Or something. You're very diplomatic about Yoko. I think you say at that point, you said, no slave to melody. Uh, Yoko <laughs> indulges in a, a series of hums and shrieks or whatever. You know, so you remember the, I know that, 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 that uh, I suppose it was his first solo album in a way, but um, uh, live in Toronto. That yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the whole of the second side is her just <laughs> screeching. Yeah. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, Kyoko! Like that. Yeah. You remember that song? It's really horrid. <laughs> horrid. I think you actually... Horrid, Craig I think, I, I, think, think, I, I bet think, neither of you have listened to that. No, uh, not for no, a long, long time. No, no. And I probably didn't even listen to the whole of the, the thing at the you know, first time round. I think you actually say, I may be wrong about this, uh, my, my favourite line about Yoko, and I, I think you say it's difficult to pinpoint her talent. Yes, that's right. <laughs> but actually, people, I, I kind of realised when I was writing that chapter, you know, people are, um, are very kind of loyal to... No, you know, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially, especially in the States, it was a bit of a sort of backlash. Yeah. You know, yeah. But I think it's sweet the way you're listening to the White Album, you're looking at all those pictures, it's the first time we've seen pictures of the Beatles not smiling, really. It's and you think not, it's your, no. you're looking for clues into the adult world. I thought it was a really interesting way yes, of looking at it. It's a major step. Four, Paul in his bath and things like yeah. that. It's all quite odd. And Ringo dancing with Elizabeth Taylor. Yes. Um, yeah. It was uh, yes, and those kind of things you don't you can't get on CDs and actually you can't get CDs full stop. But you know yeah. that, that big chart was very. Um, it was a little window into the into the adult. Yeah. And but so you yeah. started. You started, like you, you started. You started with the Beatles wig. So they, the Beatles wig. So does that mean the Beatles entered your life as kind of comic relief? Were they? Um, well, I think that in sixty, I suppose it must have been the winter sixty four rather than sixty three. Um, and yeah, so I, we all knew them because of uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, my parents and their friends are uh, horrified by the fact that they sang yeah, yeah, yeah rather than yes, 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 which it turned out then. <laughs> Paul McCartney's father. When McCartney's he, own father was too. He, he was upset. So uh, um, he was fair enough. But uh, so that was the first, and then and then getting the Beatles. So we must have known all about the Beatles, but just as kind of figures rather than the music. And then getting these uh, very uh, hard plastic uh, wigs, which cut into your ears around here. Uh, yeah. I don't suppose we wore them for very long. We probably had one photograph taken. Um, <laughs> But I mean, they. I, I think when um, the Beatles, well, in '64, people were wearing uh, uh, someone, uh, George Martin, uh, driving down Madison Avenue, saw these businessmen wearing Beatles wigs. I mean, it's, it's. Um, I think you can't uh, underestimate. Well, you both know, but you can't underestimate just how amazingly successful the Beatles were uh, yeah. in America at that moment. Much more so than any other. Oh, absolutely. Group or. Did you have a favourite Beatle when you were that um, age? Yeah. Oh, when I was that age? Yeah. Well, probably the same as uh, my age now. I, it was probably Paul. I, I think everyone did have to have a favourite. Uh, and yeah. he just, um, and in the same way, this is a very un rock and roll uh, opinion to have. But I suppose it was then and now because he was the most wholesome. Uh, yeah. You know, and I, I, he just seemed you know, the nicest and the cheeriest and uh, he always seemed to be making an effort and all that kind of thing. And I, I The most yeah. user-friendly, wasn't he? He was good at, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, PR. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But PR, in a way, sometimes PR is just kind of manners, isn't it? But I, I yeah. yeah, he was the opposite of Johnny Rotten, I suppose. Yeah. Well, look, if it's not too obvious a question, uh, why did you want to write a book about the Beatles? Um, well, well, one reason was because I was writing a book about the Thames and uh, and I wasn't really making much progress with it. And then I thought, I suddenly thought, oh God, of course, the Beatles. And then, uh, and then I, my publisher got As ready. you do when you're thinking about the Thames. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you, I mean, often I have a, I mean, almost all the time I have some kind of song in my head, you know, rattling around. Like yesterday it was MacArthur Park by Richard oh, Harris. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. I've been telling my... Um, daughter that Jared had that she'd been watching the terror and Jared Harris's father I said you know he was very very famous and he did this really odd number one 
and then I was trying to remember the lyrics. Anyway, I usually have a, um, a song going in my head, and I suppose I had lots of Beatles songs uh, as I was walking the Thames. Uh, and I mean, I, d I don't think I particularly knew why I wanted I just thought, oh, well, there's a book and I can do something. And I'd done this book about um, Princess Margaret, which saw her from lots of uh, different angles. And I just thought, well, I could do the same with the Beatles, which in fact, you can't really do the same with the Beatles because uh, Princess Margaret is a very limited subject. It's, she's a limited character. And so you can, can kind of cover the waterfront with her or cover every front with her. Whereas the Beatles, you, you know, you could spend the rest of your life writing about the Beatles. You know, so you get the day. impression. Yeah, I read uh, the Princess uh, the Mom Darling book is fantastic. And I got the impression that you've basically gone through a lot of the biographies at the time, looked in the index to see where they mentioned her and taken those stories and reworked yeah, yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. And I guess you must have done the same with the Beatles, because there were two stories really early on that Dave and I were remarking on, which we didn't know. One was the story about Beryl Bainbridge's party in 1960, <laughs> with Silver Beats turn up. She must tell that story. And the other is the Malcolm Muggeridge incident in the Reaper Bar in 1961. It's just incredible that Malcolm Muggeridge met the Beatles, you know. But, yeah, but I already, they were revelations, weren't they, both those I stories? Already, I knew, already knew about Malcolm Muggeridge because I was sort of very interested in him at one point. And so I had his diaries, which are very good. I recommend them. Yeah. Beryl Bainbridge. I knew Beryl a little bit. I'm not sure she ever uh, spoke with me about the Beatles. I think <coughs> what I did, one of the... Uh, me clever things I did was um, getting uh, a full list of everyone who had ever been on uh, Desert Island Discs and had chosen a Beatles song. All right. And I then listened uh, to each of those Desert Island Discs, or I mean, you can listen to 90% of them. Uh, and so I was kind of fishing. I, I think probably with Beryl, she, I think she did choose one of the Beatles songs. I mean, hers was a very, you know, she chose two little boys and so that she was very eccentric. Um, wow. Uh, and I suppose, and so that alerted me, though. So then I got um, the biggest biography of her. I mean, it's quite a, or it's a large biography of her. Uh, and then that had a, a bit about her. Um, yeah, so I, I have quite um, a kind of eclectic uh, right. library and, and, and virtually everyone uh, well known. Uh, this is a generalization, but you know, who was born since the war met the met the Beatles somewhere, yeah, yeah. you know, and remembered yeah. it. Yeah, and I think yeah. that 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 sort of side hadn't really been plundered by other people. I mean, I, I was obviously aware while I was doing the book that lots and lots of very good books have been written about the Beatles or by their wives or girlfriends or you know by Brian Epstein, yeah. whatever. Uh, and so uh, the all that stuff had been plundered already. And so I had to go slightly off piece then. But that, right. that, that yeah. appealed to my mentality anyway. So. Yeah, but I suppose that's also what, what makes it work, that you can, you can uh, devote a few pages, I can't remember how many pages it is, to the Malcolm Muggeridge meeting, because, hey, it's Malcolm Muggeridge, for goodness yeah. sake. That's kind of funny. Whereas, presumably, I, this must be published in the United States, is it? I mean, what, what do the American publishers think about Malcolm Muggeridge and Beryl Bainbridge. I don't Bridget. know. They didn't. They never said, "Oh, we should take that out." I oh, mean, okay. I think maybe Malcolm Muggeridge, because he then he went kind of right wing in his old age, as people tend yeah. to. Yeah, and I yeah. think he might have become a slight figure in. Oh, uh, I see. He was a great yeah. star, uh, Mother Teresa, but they. Uh, but I think that I imagine they don't know who Kenneth Williams is, for instance. No, uh, <laughs> no, they wouldn't. <laughs> um, yeah, she refuses I, I, to go I, I, and I, compare I, the magical I mystery love... tour party. <laughs> That's that, a great story. In some ways, um, the Princess Margaret book, which was also, uh, that was a bigger success in America than the Beatles, actually. I mean, that right. hundreds of people that it would be completely... Yeah, different. I suppose so. So uh, I think you can just get, get on with reading it. But you, then, are, you are very attracted to... This is quite interesting, Kenneth Williams, use Anthony Burgess. You're quite attracted to the idea of people who didn't like them. Yes. Who were very yeah. public about... Uh, and also, you kind of feel that they're, they're, just, they're just jealous of them, aren't they, in a, in a lot of ways? They're jealous of their attention. Is that well, fair to in, say? In some ways, in, in some cases, I think that uh, jealousy was warranted. I mean, I talk about my father's generation. He was born 1920, and my father-in-law, 1923. And they were, you know, when the, the age of the Beatles' success, you know, 1920, 21, 
they were all, you know, they were fighting in Normandy. Absolutely. So they, they had their youth stolen from them. Yeah. And then it's only 20 years later. So, I mean, it seems to me extraordinary now that, you know, my father was born only 20 years before uh, yeah. John. Um, but you can see then when you're, you know, you're then 40 and, and you see all their fun. And also they were, they, not oh, John slightly, but, but that generation were also poking fun at the people who had fought in the war. Absolutely. So I have Completely. A, a kind of sympathy with them. I um, do too. Yeah, yeah. My father was the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's, it's funny in you know, all the Beatles films, they 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 kind of come up against military types, don't they? Yes. One way yes. or another, magical mystery tour it happens, doesn't it? And and, yes, and in um, uh, Hard Days Night. Oh uh, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. I know there's a military sort of type man on yeah, the Richard Vernon. I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. with the yeah. bowler hat. <laughs> and it was the standing joke, wasn't it? I fought in the war for you lot. Yes, yes. It was a joke at the time. I mean, yeah. well, to, to my generation, it was a joke, you know. Nowadays, people take all that stuff immensely seriously. They and didn't I, at the time. I have a, um, a, a little chapter. My, my father was in uh, Long Melford in Suffolk. I, I just oh, remember right. him saying that he'd been in this hotel and John and Yoko had been trying to get in as he was getting out or the other way round. Um, and he's, he said, but I stood my ground. <laughs> and so, and <laughs> the thing, but the funny thing is you can now, you know, uh, rather like I can date, you know, years at my prep school because of when an Abbey Road came out or whatever, or what time I, what day I would have got it through the post. But I could date my father being in Long Melford just by looking up, you know, these amazing books which tell you what was happening what? every day of the Beatles' lives. Ab yes, yes. Yeah. absent. Yeah, it's yeah. a funny way of charting my father's life. You know? No, I, I know exactly what you mean. I, yeah, it, it is. There, there can't be any. Well, what is it? A nine-year career or whatever it is. There can't be any other career that's been as closely documented. No, and I mean the managing editor of Private Eye, uh, Sheila Molnar said, oh, yeah, I first saw the Beatles in 1964 in, uh, I can't remember where it was, Leeds or something. Um, and I could just look up and I could tell her, oh, yeah, that was, you know, September the 19th. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it is rather extraordinary, that. It is. So reading the book, I, I, it really made me think the Hamburg section, which is so rich in anecdote and so funny and entertaining, made me think how absolutely fundamental that is to the Beatles story. You know, that their whole idea of their style and their image, the music, the internal dynamic of the group and the lineup itself, all of that came together in that incredible kind of adversity. And they survive, you know, living in the rooms at the Bambi Kino. They survive this terrible, <laughs> terrible experience. And having survived that, they could survive anything. Don't you think Hamburg is absolutely fundamental to yes, the, I was actually, the entire I was, story? I was kind of nervous of writing that because, I, you know, I couldn't really sort of add anything to the mix. And so I was rather reliant on other uh, people's books or were very reliant. Um, but then I did sort of work out ways. Like there was a... <laughs> There was a bit, I think, it, well, it would have been in Mark Lewison's book anyway, but of uh, George being sick on the floor. And, uh, oh, God, there's the pile of vomit. Thing. So I think I made a, a whole chapter on, on, you know, with little sort of one, two, three, four subtitles of, of uh, the day-to-day -day story of this pool of vomit. The pool of what you did, that's right, which ends up with cigarette butts. Very, very stubborn it? kind of character which you don't necessarily, you know, we now see him as very spiritual and all that guy, but he was very, very stubborn character. And he refused to mop up this pile of vomit for a reason. And so, right. and the others weren't going to do it, and there were obviously no cleaners there. And so yeah. they just left it there, going mould. And eventually, yeah. they, uh, you know, after two weeks or something, they did pick it up, and they had a sort of funeral procession for this now very rock hard pool of vomit. And it, <laughs> I, I, I remember when I, um, I read Hunter Davis's book when it came out, it must have been sort of 69, so when I was 12 or something. And I, and I remember being very shocked by, uh, by their life in Hamburg. Yeah, yeah. And, it, yeah. and I think Hunter Davis, you know, it was slightly um, expurgated. Oh, know. very definitely. Yeah. I um, love those chapters where you, we, go on, sorry. No, no, I mean, you're right. I mean, it, it was just a, a, a very kind of rough time for, I mean, like any kind of virtual world, well, the word teenagers in, uh, in anywhere. 
you know, they, that's pretty revolting. Though. Absolutely. Oh, it is. It is. Now, I was going to say, I love those chapters where you see a different side of all their personalities. You know, often they're reacting in the same way. There's a lovely story where we're on a plane going to Portland in 1965 and the, and the engine catches fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They all react in a different way. Ringo kind of stares at the fire kind of <laughs> manically. Paul tries to kind of act cool, but is obviously terrified. You know, George, uh, John, I think, starts screaming and trying to open the, 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 the emergency exit. And George just wanders to the back and says, Beatles and children first. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was yeah. so lovely to see all four of their characters exposed. You know? It reminds me of that. Do you remember there's a scene in Spinal Tap where they're in a plane which is about to go down and one of them suddenly says, I've been gay all my life. And he, he suddenly comes out. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's almost famous, actually. Yes, that's the Cameron Crowe film. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. But I Were there any particular chapters that, that, that had revelations in them uh, that told you stuff about the Beatles that you really didn't know or, or that modified your view of, of, of the group and the way they worked? Um, yeah, well, yes, I'm sure there were. I mean, um, I didn't... I, for instance, I didn't know how long uh, Paul had stayed with the Asher family and what a, yeah. and what a kind of influential time that was on, on him and, and how the family kind of completely took him under their wing. I'll tell you something odd uh, that I got very into um, reading about Jane Asher's father, who is this uh. incredibly intelligent, articulate doctor who invented the term Munchausen syndrome, among other things. And I was yeah. reading his um, British Medical Journal article. Actually, he, didn't really, he wrote about four, but they're all very, very good and easy to understand. Um, but I didn't put into the book that he committed suicide. And I think that was, um, I just, I think it was because I didn't want him to have done. You know, it was a sort of dereliction of yeah. duty in a way. Um, and this was, and it was also after the, the time of the Beatles, I think. Yeah. Um, and so there are funny things that you, you leave out of books uh, for, for, in a way, no good reason. Or yeah. reasons personal to you. Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry, that's a... a that it, it is extraordinary, the, the, the kind of, the, the Asher family. And Paul McCartney, suddenly from Liverpool, you know, he, <laughs> you know, it's not uncommon for people to find, people like Paul McCartney to find a family is slightly more sophisticated than yeah. his own, yeah. but it's usually they live across town. Whereas in Paul McCartney's case, they were 250 miles away and they were the most extraordinary family, weren't they? Mother was a musician. You know, yeah. Jane was an actress. Peter was an actor, wasn't he? I mean, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they'd done all kinds of Even things. Even Jane's younger sister had, you know... <laughs> Yeah, was incredible, herself. incredible <laughs> achievers, you know. And suddenly, yeah, mum had taught George Martin the oboe or something. Yeah, yeah, some yeah. connection. Yeah, amazing. She did. She did. And, yeah. and and suddenly, you got Paul McCartney is living there, knocking out yesterday, or I want to hold your hand or whatever on the piano in, in the yeah, basement. Where it was. Someone you know who was just born to always fall on his feet in some way. Yeah, uh, I mean, you could say, well, he did have to marry Heather Mills McCartney to, to prove that. But, um, you know, he, even yeah. after that, he fell on his feet. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's a, it's a great knack, I think. But it is extraordinary, you know, as, he, as you're referring to earlier, the stories of all the kind of, you know, the fringe characters, the Jane Nashers, the Brian Epsteins, they're all fascinating, aren't they? In yeah. their own ways. I mean, when I got, um, I had to really cut back the, uh, chat. Actually, I, there was what uh, I did much more on Fred Lennon, and I thought, no, this is going mad. This I love the Fred Lennon Lennon stuff. I, I love, love all the Fred Lennon. Lennon. I, I look where he dresses up as a dustman. I like look forward to his reappearance party. regularly. And oh. I thought, when's Fred going to come back? <laughs> yeah, he turns up with an eighteen-year-old girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. oh, whose book? Uh, she wrote a book uh, called "My Life with Fred." Or something. I can't. Oh, the girlfriend. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they the girlfriend of Fred Lennon wrote a book. That's fantastic. No, no. Uh, no, she wrote a book about him. Yeah. Uh, Fred, yeah, Fred did this uh, single called It's My Life. Yes, yeah, so re that's right. I remember seeing him on TV. Yeah, yeah I did. Miming yeah, yeah. to it or whatever and it was. He, yeah. he came up with this conspiracy theory that it, you know, it would have got into the charts, but Brian Epstein <laughs> lent kept it. it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he reversed hyped it. He was so powerful, yeah. he could keep it out of the chart. He, he bought it out of the chart. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do like, one of the things I like about the book is that um, 
And it's possible that you can only do this after a long period of time. That you can write the tawdry side of it alongside the, you know, the kind of elevated side of it. Yes. And one doesn't diminish the other, does it? You know yeah. what I mean? They yeah. can do all Actually, kinds of terrible with, um, things. With Fre- I mean, going back to Fred, it is quite interesting because it it it, uh, it sheds, shows light on um, on John's character because half the time he wanted to really be friends with his father, and then his father was, was pretty sort of unforgivable in a way. <laughs> yes, he was so, completely. Uh, you know, he started sort of trying to get off with. I, I think he made a pass at, at Cynthia once. Yeah. In a maidenhead uh, nightclub, um, uh, and so he was Garcia, and and then he'd really, I mean, he, he, so he'd love his father and take him in, and then he'd really hate him, and uh, you could see, uh, yeah, so he was, you could see John's sort of idealistic side and his uh, sort of sadistic or tawdry side, and a yeah. lot of people's story is like that, yeah. Um, or with Brian Epstein, you know, uh, on one level he was this very organised. Um, well-to-do person. On another level, he was completely all over the place in pieces. Um, Why did you choose, talking about Epstein, you you end with this extraordinary sequence of kind of reverse chronological dates. It's really, really imaginative and really clever way to end the book, but it's all hooked around Epstein and ends with them first meeting him, actually. Why did you decide to end the book Built uh, with it built around him. I mean, is it because you thought he was the most significant person in the story outside and, uh, of the four of them? Uh, no, well, apart from the four, I suppose he's the yeah. most significant. Um, it was also the book begins with uh, him going down the steps of the cavern. Mm-hmm. And I've yeah. always liked books which have a kind of symmetry to them or a yeah, yeah. kind of pattern. Uh, and so quite late on, I suddenly thought, you know, I was thinking, what should I do with Brian? and um, and then quite late on in writing the book, uh, I suddenly thought, oh, God, yeah, I could end in the same way. And, of course, there is some kind of, it's not a kind of symmetry, but there's a sort of logic to it because um, as he, uh, in the first chapter, as he's going down the cavern steps, it's, it's the moment of the Beatles' big break. I think if he hadn't gone down the cavern steps, it's, it's perfectly likely that they would never have been a success. You can't prove that, but, you know, he really did clean them up and market them. And he was Well, they would, might have had two or three hits and it might yeah, have yeah. fizzled out, yeah. mind it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And so, so it's the salvation of the Beatles that moment, but it also, and you, uh, but also in a way, it's the start of the downfall of Brian Epstein. It was when he, he stopped being, you know, well-to-do son of a, a Liverpool family with, a, uh, you know, various stores. Um, and he embarks on this thing where, you know, five years later, he's, he's going to die. Uh, yeah. and so it was a sort of way of the beginning and end are exactly the same. The, the first and last chapter is exactly the same. And so it, it kind of, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, I can see that you could, you also it had to end somewhere and it would be just, you could end just on the last day of the Beatles, but uh, you know, it's not yeah. interesting. Um, and I thought doing his life in, uh, reverse was just um, an, an interesting way of treating his life. I, I was trying to, I mean, because of, as I was saying, all these books, good books about the Beatles having been written before, I was always conscious that I was having to do something new, uh, take new angles, do something kind of tricky yeah. or, uh, or more fun. Uh, and so that was just one of the ways. But it is a unique tale because... You know, you know, like you're saying, those those key meet, meetings with Brian Epstein, George Martin, Ed Sullivan, a few key people who changed everything. Yes, and yeah. they were very fortunate to find those people. They didn't find yeah. the wrong people or they kept away from the wrong people. And you look at them alongside the careers of everybody else, whether it's the kinks or whatever, who didn't meet the right people. Yeah. The Beatles yeah, yeah. just had that, possibly because of four of them. I don't, I don't know. I'd say I, was, I, go on. I should have written more about uh, George Martin, actually. I mean, I'd like to, I, I, you know, now when I see the book, I think that it should be more George Martin because I think, I think he was completely crucial because I can imagine, you know, most uh, producers who are sort of 15 years older than them would have told them, you know, would have said, oh, no, I know more than you. You know, you don't do it like this. And he was always very good at channeling into what they wanted and then 
You know, oh, absolutely. John was very bad. Oh, there's an, there's uh, an incredible bit. There's an incredible bit where um, I think it's the day after Brian Epstein had died and they're in Abbey Road and they're trying to keep going. And they're trying to keep recording. And John then says, I've written this song. And he sits down and plays just with an acoustic. I am what is in fact, I'm the walrus, you know, and they're all standing around. And George Martin sort of says, I think at one point, someone asked him, did he really say, um, you know, boy, you've been a naughty girl, you let your knickers down, whatever it is, you know, it's all that crab a lock of fish cake and all those lyrics. Yeah, yeah. And he says, what do you want me to do with this? And he's obviously thinking, this is absolutely unusable. But to his eternal credit, he goes back and allows John to try and shake this song. And they finish up with this absolute masterpiece. You think it's, it's incredible. And actually, right? John, uh, later on, after the Beatles, I think in those sort of last interviews he was doing with uh, Rolling Stone or whoever it was, you know, he was then kind of, mean to george martin he's oh, uh, and he actually oh, unbelievably fighting i am the walrus oh it should have just been done simply you put a lot no, of no, no. but of course you couldn't you couldn't imagine a cover well actually there have been cover versions of i am the walrus but they, they yeah, follow, yeah they follow exactly the same lines of george martin you couldn't imagine an acoustic set doing i am the walrus and yet with george martin it is a great masterpiece he he just knew how to tweak something yeah. To make it radio friendly, to make it sound good on the radio. Yeah. It's only this year that I've discovered, and it may seem like a tiny thing, that there are bongos on a hard day's night. <laughs> Go and listen to a hard day's night. There are bongos on it. And the reason that George Martin said, no, I just think you need something. And it yeah. does. And he just gave it that little extra thing. Or, but John, or John would say something like, oh, I want this to sound like, um, you know, it's being sung on the moon or something yeah. like that. You would get yeah, exactly. But somehow George Martin would be able to intuit what John wanted. Yeah, yeah. I find but, it so thrilling, the speed at which they worked. You describe the brilliant bit in uh, Majestic Ballroom, I think, in Newcastle in 1963, where they've got 20 minutes before they go on stage. And John, um, Paul says, let's have a Siggy and write a song. And they write, she loves you, <laughs> and then record it, what, three or four days later. And the other two members of the group have never heard it. And yeah. yet they write, they record it in whatever it is, four or five hours. They arrange it and complete the entire thing. And you think, uh, particularly in this day and age, it's so extraordinary to think that they worked with that kind of spontaneity, uh, spontaneity and empathy, I think. Do you yeah. think with, with, uh, with rock that, you know, kind of genius, uh, you know, it comes quickly and then it goes away quickly? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With the it Beatles, does. it just did last that time. And, OK, John and Paul, and to some extent, George, did good things afterwards, but nothing was as good as the Beatles, I don't think. Um, no, well, Dave's got, always got this theory that actually the Beatles had kind of three careers. Dave always says the most people have just three years, is it? And there were three lots of Beatles. Was well, the, there's was the two, kind of two lots. Tops, and then there's the psychedelic. A, and, yeah, there's two groups. There's the mop yeah. tops and there's yeah. the psychedelic adventurers. That's your lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Um, and what, when, what do you think? The, mo the dividing line with Brian's death or something. No, um, probably slight. Well, it's oh, it's when they stop touring, isn't it? Really, yeah, yeah. You, know, I, you know, the first bit of the Beatles is you know what what I often call their personal pronoun period. You know, she loves you, I want to hold your hand. Yeah, and, that sort of, and then it starts being songs about things, Eleanor Rigby or or, or whatever. You know, and that that's when he moves. And one in what is. One is the live years and one is the studio years, I, I suppose. The, the surprising, I mean, you were asking what things surprised me. I was surprised how early they took drugs, actually. I mean, how early yeah. they were taking acid. Yeah. And actually, you know, the song Help, which is seen as the mop top, well, it is part of the mop top, but it actually yeah. was like, you know, it sounds it's very cry boring. for help. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it simultaneously sounds like the most optimistic thing you've ever heard in your life. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's just what well, that's that's what they brought off. But I suppose if he'd if he'd come out with that song later, it would have been like that's what I find very dreary. Don't let me down. Yeah, that uh, it would have yeah. been. Like, it would have been. <laughs> it would have been like that. Saved by having. Yeah. And I think that's one of the fun things about the Beatles. You can have um, uh, very maudlin lyrics with very happy tune, or the other way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Bungalow yeah. Bill is one of their greatest songs, but, you know, it is about a, a serial killer, I think, or, or um, uh, Maxwell Silver Hammer is another odd yes. one. But it's, it's the way that the story keeps on producing stuff. Like Mike and Mark and I only discovered a couple of years ago from Mark Lewis that there was a mean Mr. Mustard. 
there really was. I mean, Mr. Mustard, he lives not far, he lived not far from where I'm living now. He was written about in the papers. He, he, he shaved in the dark, all that he stuff. Shaved he shaved in the dark. He was called Mustard. Sorry? Uh, yeah. He was going to yes, he was. It was called Mustard. Came from called Mr. Mustard. He used to it's... make his, uh, to save electricity, he used to make his wife listen to the radio. She's watching, listening to the radio. She had to listen in the dark. So if you're watching television, obviously you need a bit of light, but in the radio, you might as well turn the light off, you know. And there was a little thing um, in a local paper, wasn't it? And, no, it's uh, gone, it's gone into the national papers. It got into the, the national yeah, I think there was a divorce or something. There was some case. And, um, but it's, there's no other group where these little stories keep turning up. Yeah. I saw one on Twitter this morning. I couldn't believe it. That Beat Instrumental, the magazine, uh, had a competition in 1964, I think, to win George Harrison's guitar, the one that he'd played in Hamburg. And so loads of people entered, and a guy who won it said, no, I don't want the guitar. I want the cash value. <laughs> so they gave him like 25 quid or whatever oh, it was. God. The guitar what was subsequently terrible. sold for a quarter of a million pounds. I'm sure. I'm sure. Many years ago, probably for sell for many millions now. Oh, you no. know. Yes. Well, that serves him right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, it serves him right. I, w I wish I had known, well, that story and um, Mr. Mustard. <laughs> oh, the, uh, there will be more. Craig, if you return to the subject in due you, you course. go back and do it again. There will be more. Because there say, are so many. I'd it's like funny when you... Mr. Mustard ever knew that he was uh, in this song. He might have made <laughs> his life, you know. I, I wonder if he was still alive. God knows. I don't know. But it's full of such extraordinary coincidences. I can never get over the fact that the girl, Melanie Coe, Oh, but God. McCartney, uh, you know, adjudges the winner of the twisting competition on Ready, Steady, Go is the same girl who was leaving home that he read about in the paper that he based she's leaving home on. No, and that the, the postman who delivers Paul's fan mail is the same guy who was driving the car that killed Julia Leonard. I mean, these are extraordinary coincidences. And um, there's a funny, also, I think I put as a footnote, uh, which is which shows how irrelevant a lot of the book is, but the, the girl who is in, uh, she's leaving home then when, when she went to America, she had an affair with a Burt Ward who played Robin in Batman. And oh, Robin. God. Oh, right. That's fantastic. You see, oh that, that, God. Well, that's the beauty of that. That's the beauty of the book. It's that serendipitous side of it, isn't it? You yeah, just, it is. You just wander off, you know, you, ne you never get tired of those little, those little connections. I know. So what's next, <laughs> Craig? You're going to write about the Beatles again? Um, the surely you North could do Earth. another. No, I sort of, I, th I think you shouldn't uh, go back to stuff. I mean, they are, you know, I, I, I could, I suppose. But I, I think it would be silly. It would just be like a reheat. Um, um, and then I thought, oh, well, I could do a biography of the Queen. And then I thought, no, that's a reheat of Margaret. I mean, it's not exactly. Um, so at the moment, I just don't know. I mean, the, the good and the bad thing about doing a book uh, uh, is that, you know, it sort of keeps you going. You know, you don't have to write another one because, you know, there are nice things like this or, you know, the paperback comes out or there's a literary festival or something. And so you can feel you're sort of still working. And it is, it is a, it's a distraction. You know, I should, I've had a whole, I gave it in, I suppose, in December of, uh, you know, 2019. So I've had plenty of time to write another book, but I haven't. And instead, I've just been thinking, oh, what should I write about? But that's the... But you have, as, as a lot of the, the, the very nice, and rightly very nice reviews of the book said, you have invented a whole new biography uh, format, really. So well, your publishers must, must be very keen for you to, to, to replicate that. With a new well, in a way, it's such format, a clever idea. I mean, it's quite a for easy format to recognise. You just leave out the boring stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't tell anyone that's that. <laughs> you no, know, that's your really, secret, is it? Yeah, it doesn't really take <laughs> Alan Turing or something to crack that code. But um, it yeah. just, I don't know if you remember, but when I was at prep school, there were things called Jackdaw. Do you remember Jackdaw? They were for history. And you'd get a, yeah. instead of a book, you'd get this folder. Yeah. Uh, sort of A4 folder. And you'd, if it was uh, Charles I, you'd have the document showing his uh, execution, execution yeah. and just lots and lots of documents and you could read it in your own order and, I was, uh, uh, and so i think in a way the jackdaw folder uh invented <laughs> that thing and you just had the the exciting bits and with the beatles i find virtually everything interesting actually even the dullest day of their life would, would be interesting 
It, it is. is. I couldn't it agree is. more. It it is. And I always think that I see a picture of them and I kind of try and find the date and I work out what they were doing on well, that Well, that's day. what we were think, talking about. My yeah. God, they were just about to record I'm Down or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I think yeah. that somehow just informs your view of looking at that. It makes it intensely exciting. I know that's probably a very... Um, it's the inner schoolboy in me still, but I find that really, really thrilling, actually. And it doesn't apply to any other group, does it? No, I, no, and no. that's so unusual. There's, a, there's another, there's another bit in the book where McCartney in 1966, I think, goes abroad on his own. You cannot imagine this being possible now. In disguise and yeah. goes into French clubs. He wanders around Paris on his own with his movie camera, wearing a false moustache. Am I right in a flat cap and glasses? Yes, yeah, so, which he went to Berman and Nathan's to get the day. Yes. So it's quite a kind of theatrical way of, of being obscure, you know. He actually got, got a theatrical costumiers to make him uh, glasses, yeah. with a lenses and uh, the moustache. Um, but, but I, I, you know, yeah. Isn't probably, that an extraordinary story? Yeah, and it's quite a sweet story in a way, because then he admit, and it shows how sort of well-rounded he is, because then he can't, by the time he gets to the south of France after a few weeks, he then wants a bit of fun, wants to go to a nightclub, but they won't admit him. They think he's too scruffy or something. And so he goes off and goes back to his uh, hotel, takes off his moustache, and, uh, and then they say, oh, Paul McCartney, you know. Paul you McCartney, mean, come on in. And then he realises, actually, there is something to be said for fame, you know. <laughs> That's uh, right. Yes, he's learned a valuable lesson. I know. Definitely, definitely. Well, it's look, Craig, good. it's been lovely talking to you. Um, we, we ask you to think about... What's your favourite Beatles record? Well, it it um it changes. I mean, it's sort of perennial sort of top ten of, you know, Hey Jude and things like that. Um, I do like uh, Come Together, but actually recently, um, in my head has been a more obscure one. Um, uh, Baby, you're a rich man. Oh you know, right, oh, yeah, okay. Okay. the B side of something. What was it? The all B-side? you need is all you need. Yeah, is it was. was. It's, it's about 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 Epstein, I think, isn't it? Yes. Was it about Epstein? Yeah. Oh, there, so. is, yeah. there, is, there is a version where you can hear John uh, yeah. Lennon sing a rather... Anyway, a, a fat Jew or something. Yeah, like that. something like that. That's yeah. right. Something, yeah. yes, uh, almost unrepeatable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there was an element of that actually in the book that I didn't put in lots of uh, stuff. I, I had a, you know, one of my fathers was cru- C for cruelty and John's cruelty and, and his anti-Semitism and, and his hatred of uh, disabled people. And, you know, it's kind of dark side of John. But then I thought, I thought, well, you know, he was a teenager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. You, I, I've always become very forgiving about it. There was a bit in Hamburg where he beats up a sailor, doesn't he? Mugs a sailor and steals his wallet. You know, and you think, my God. You know. We've all done that. And I mean, he, he, we've all done it. And he had a very um, complicated yeah, was, life. Was, <laughs> nasty. I mean, Cynthia and another... Um, uh, girl in Liverpool uh, that were beaten up by John. I mean, he he had a, you know, oh, he yeah, was, uh, yeah. these days I think he'd ha- have trouble becoming a you know lovable mop top. I think the stories would get out. We're yeah, we're yeah, we're, fi- we're finding that increasingly nowadays. We um we're talking to somebody who's written a a, a, a biography of Steve Marriott, Small Faces. You yeah. Know? yeah. And Steve Marriott, known throughout his life, has been re- very difficult, bit of a drinker. You know. That, drug fiend chase women or whatever but of course nowadays the discussion is well nowadays he would be adhd it would be you know yeah. he's got problems he's got because yeah. Yeah. all the things that people, people used to think that were the kind of wild little eccentric eccentric edges of rock stars and now regarded as conditions that could be treated and probably could you know yeah 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 yeah, yeah. that's interesting but it changes the it changes what you know it changes the kind of great pantomime of rock and roll, doesn't it? Really, if you, if yes, you can... I wonder if now you could. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to think of the last group which became famous because of bad behaviour. I mean, it's, um, well, there were Beastie Boys or something like that. Or... That's Beastie a long time Boys, ago. Oasis and people like that. Probably there's an element of it. I should imagine. Yeah, Beastie Boys are a really good example. That was but that's, a, entire... that's a long old time ago. That is. Yes, yeah, it was. Yes. Now probably you couldn't because it would always involve. Uh, violence or, uh, or, or, or something on some yeah, yeah. Person, personal issue that could be treated well look thank you very much for your time craig well i've enjoyed what it fun. a lot like that was great fun and uh 
It's a yeah. fantastic book. It really is. I keep it by the bed and I read it as a, I dip in every now and again, read it as a, like short stories, you know, at night. It's fantastic. No, I do, they're all uh, the length of kind of tracks on an album, really. Right. They are. They are. Yeah, right. It's brilliant. It is the greatest story I ever told as we were as we were saying to Tom Holland the other week, you know, you just, you never get fed up of it, the Beatles story, you know, particularly when it's done as originally as this. So yeah. thanks very much, Craig. Um